the minister walking up to the pedal. He got very quiet all of a sudden. Well, <laughs> hello everybody and welcome to the next installment in the Timothy Johnson Medical Scholar Series. Uh, I think everybody, most everybody in the room has heard this before, but it's always worth repeating that Dr. Johnson was one of the important founders of the BTC School of Medicine and very committed to the role of research and science in medicine and it is his, in his honor uh, that this particular program has been named. And as you know, we're very fortunate to have leading medical scholars from all over the country come and participate in these. And today is certainly no exception to that with the visit of Dr. Rosen. But I'm going to let uh, Dr. Rene LeClaire from the Department of Basic Science Education introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rosen. So, Rene, go ahead. Hi, everyone. <laughs> 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 For sure. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Um, and you guys are very fortunate. It's a great setup, and I've just been, had a great time and had a great run along the river, which was nice this morning. I was a little worried that I'd get lost, but this is tropical weather compared to what I'm used to, so that picture is somewhat reflective of uh, what we usually run in. So to have bare ground and 28 degrees is a dream. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to talk about exercise, and, uh, and, and the underlying lesson behind this, I'll come back to at the end, the art of medicine, is really to understand uh, how we process information and how, how we as scientists think about things that we want to believe in, but sometimes find that science leads us in a different path. And it's amazing to think... Um, of the number of investigators that I work with who are so tied into their hypothesis that they don't see the forest from the trees. And I think one of the basic lessons that I'm going to talk about today, since I've been a runner for 38 years, is that I believed I had the religiosity of running, that it does everything for everything. And to sort of come back and, and, and see how we went to the mouse and went to the cell and came back to the mouse and then came to humans, I think is an interesting story. So I'm going to try it out on you guys. I haven't done it that much. We published this paper in Cell just a few weeks ago. And so this is my first attempt to, but I think a, a, an interesting attempt because uh, it's for students like yourself. So some of the lessons we learned. So first I'll talk a little bit about um, the bench the, be the bedside approach to understanding um, what exercise may do to bone. And then I'll move to some of the mechanisms that may be operative. And then come back to some of the physiology of this molecule, irisin, which has attracted a lot of attention um, and uh, is very interesting at a mechanism phase. So I just found this slide on the web. I was looking for it. said, everybody believes exercise does everything good. So, so uh, it does. And... Uh, it was entitled, I changed it a little bit, but 50 things that exercise does, uh, that's great. Body happiness, body image, body tone. You know, I'm a skinny little guy, so I have a much better body image after running 38 years. Um, so I believe that. Immunity, longevity, I'm hoping for. Uh, and uh, decreased diabetes risk. So what about osteoporosis risk? So about four years ago, I have a friend, uh, Gina Collada, who writes for the New York Times, and she called me, she's a runner, and we talk about running a lot off, offline. Um, she called me and said, Cliff, you know, I've been looking at the data on exercise, and it, 
and, and bone. It doesn't look very promising. And I said, you know, you're right, Gina. So I went back and did an evidence-based review. And it, it ultimately led to a, a New York Times article that said, we're not sure that exercise does much for the skeleton. And I can't tell you how many people called me up and said, Rosen, you just killed this science. You killed my grant. You killed everything. You're not, you don't know what you're talking about. Four years later, I still think Gina's right that we don't have good evidence. So let me show you what we have, and we'll go back. So I, first of all, let me just uh, remind you that osteoporosis, if, if we think it's good for bone, then we should be able to do something to protect people against fractures. And that means thinking about osteoporosis. And those of you who don't know what this disease is, it's a microarchitectural deterioration of the skeleton, and it leads to fragility. So my good friend Mary Buckstein at Harvard compares this to uh, structural failure of a bridge. And here you can see the bones break. So what are the determinants of structural failure? And one of the determinants is what the strength of the uh, skeleton actually is. And the other is what kind of injury or stress or strain or trauma is put on that. Thing. So one thing we know is that people fracture. And osteoporosis is very common, particularly in older uh, adulthood and in aging. And we know that if you measure bone density using a DEXA dual X-ray absorptiometry, that the lower your bone density is, the more uh, standard deviations away from young normal, the greater your risk of fracture. But, and this is hip fracture. And hip fractures are devastating, 50%. Uh, of hip fracture patients don't ever go back to their living situation, 20% die, 30% of men who have hip fractures die. So this is a bad disease. It's almost, as, and, and most people don't get treated. So it's almost like you go in for a heart attack into the critical care unit at the Krillin Hospital and you come out with no medications. That would seem almost absurd to anybody. But in this day and age, for a lot of different reasons, subject of another talk about adverse events of drugs, most people who fracture their hip leave the hospital never to have gotten a treatment for a subsequent fracture. The other issue around fracture is that it's not just bone density, but it's age. So the older you are, the greater your risk, even independent of bone density, but together, age and low bone mass, if you look at the 80-year-old, 20% likelihood of a hip fracture. So, the other component is falls. Falls cause fractures. So falls can lead to fractures, but most falls do not cause fractures. Most of us fall and we never fracture. Falls in individuals with low bone mass increase the risk of fractures, and aging increases the risk of both falls and fractures. So older individuals fracture. In addition, fallers fall. So those of those uh, individuals who have movement disorders or on drugs, who are overdosed on medications for pain, et cetera, more likely to fall. Those individuals are also more likely to fracture. But fallers who repetitively fall are more likely to fracture. Okay, so here is a case. This is a 96-year-old female who's semi-independent, falls at least twice a month. She has terrible osteoarthritis of the knees, so her knees are bent in like this because her doctor never, so she walks like this and she needs a walker, her doctor never suggested that she have um, hip uh, knee replacement. She uh, uses a walker, is healthy otherwise, very healthy. She's a, a one antihypertensive, and for 62 years, she's been on Premarin 0.6 for a hysterectomy. She takes thyroid 0.112. Her bone density is plus 1.2 in the spine and minus 1.5. She falls twice, at least twice a week, and up to six times a month, and yet she's never fractured. Why? Because her bone density at this age is so good. Now, why do I know all this? Because this is my mom at 96. She's amazing, and she's constantly reminding me, remember the medical students that we met with, why, why aren't you making more money? She constantly asks me that as a Jewish mother, but she's still alive. My uh, brother-in-law drove uh, his bride up to a car one day, and it was this very fancy car that he had just bought, and she nudged me and said, Cliff, why don't you have a car like that? <laughs> Anyways, three husbands later, she's doing great. 
Okay. And she's in a beautiful assisted living, too. Beautiful place in Baltimore. Okay. So what's the data? Thanks, Mom. You're a good case report. Um, and I do, I, I'll tell you, there's one problem with Jewish guilt, is that I wasn't, she lived in Florida. I should have, 20 years ago, told her to get knee replacements. She had a doc who was injecting her knees with nonsense stuff for many years. And I sort of let it pass. We were too far away. So I do have a little guilt about not fixing her knees because her brain is in great shape. Okay, so uh, this is Bonnie Specker's work on uh, meta-analysis. I sent you the paper. The only thing I want to reinforce to you is there is some effect of act physical activity on the skeleton, but it's really when you're very young. In the prepubertal age, you have about a 2% increase in bone density with uh, these kind of exercises. And Bonnie's done most of them, and Bonnie's in South Dakota. It's Vermilion, South Dakota, so you can do good research even in rural states. And she uh, has shown that if you have kids jump off you know, 18 inches and just jump like this and do that repetitively at school, you can build bone density. And building bone density early probably helps you keep bone in the bank for later in life, if you're fortunate enough to live as long as my mom has. Um, but later in life, there doesn't seem to be much effect, and that's been the, the rub. So, but it follows that an exercise program should prevent falls and fractures in adults by improving bone density, by more loading on the skeleton, we'll get to that, improving balance, reducing the number of medications, and reducing the overall morbidity from other disorders um, that could be impacted. So there's biologic plausibility in the idea, in the concept, that loading the skeleton should improve your bone, should improve your microstructure. The problem is, for a patient-specific outcome such as fracture, we don't have any data to support that. The studies have been too short, they've been bone density only, and even bone density hasn't shown much. And so we don't have strong evidence in an exercise program that whether they be 25 years of age or 65, that it's actually improving the strength of bone. Now, it may have some effect on balance, but in terms of Strength, no. And here's the data from another meta-analysis showing really virtually no impact on the skeleton. And you see, uh, most of these studies are really negative. Um, and those are the best studies to date. So why do we even think that the skeleton needs gravity? I mean, we all need to be, have gravitary forces, but why would the skeleton be particularly important? Well, we've learned something from space travel. I'm not a huge fan of space f travel, but I'm sure Dr. Freelander, being in Houston, <laughs> is exposed to a ton of the, uh, of the Johnson Space Center. But um, I sat on NASA review boards for a long time, and I was very underwhelmed with the fact that they're doing N of 1 or N of 2 trials in, in space flight. And it really doesn't tell you a lot, but it, does, it has in, a lot illustrated something. And that is, when you go up in space, you lose bone. And that is absolutely every single spaceflight uh, uh, pioneer who's been up in space is going to lose bone. And, and that loss of bone can be quite significant. And it can occur in the trabecular skeleton, which is not always imaged by DEXA. But this is by a CT, and you can see well, virtually all of them have had low bone mass, and they don't fully recover when they come back. So, um, so you've seen the, the astronauts come off the ship, and they're just, you know, they, they're very weak because their muscles are weak, but their bones are weak too, and they really don't recover that bone. And so the mechanism for that is really important to understand, because if we can understand what unloading does, we might be able to understand what loading does. So in, in our lab and other labs, we can load a mouse skeleton and improve the bone density. So you can see this is micro CT, and you can see it's increased. Uh, and then this is uh, 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 some uh, mice who are treated with propranolol. On the other hand, you can unload the mouse 
and show a marked decrease in bone mass. So these are, these are trabeculi, and you can see the difference. Look at all the red, and then just look at what happens when you unload them. So you do hind limb immobilization. So you put the mouse up, and they, you keep one leg up, and, and that leg loses a ton of bone. Now, interesting, the other leg actually can gain a little bone at that state. But there's tremendous loss of bone. So um, there have been a lot of studies in mouse that show that exercise works uh, to at least keep bone density relatively stable. So this is a really nifty study uh, done by my friend Linda Bonewald at uh, Indiana, pr previously at uh, uh, Kansas. And what she did is she took black six mice and she uh, let some of them just age out to 24 months. And others, she put a wheel in there and said, do what you want as a mouse. And mouse love to run. So they run 5K a day, usually at night, almost always at night. They sleep during the day, as many of you know. But at night, you, black six in particular, you get them, put anything in their thing that makes them run or think about running, and they'll get on that wheel and they will run. And here you can see in this trial that the, the, the mice that ran, you can see the absence of marrow fat. And here there's tons of marrow fat in a 24 month uh, mouse, black six mouse. And marrow fat uh, is something we've been very interested in for a while, can be very detrimental to the skeleton. We see it in all aged individuals, uh, except my mom, because estrogen prevents aging uh, induced marrow fat. But anyways, you can see how the exercise really kept those bones from developing this marrow adiposity and, and in a sense, kept the skeletons at a younger age. So exercise is doing something uh, to, uh, to the bone marrow anyways. So if there is an impact of physical activity on bone, what is the mechanism? So just to give you an overview, and I don't know how much bone physiology, I was never taught bone physiology, but the skeleton constantly remodels. So uh, every 10 years we get a new skeleton. It's hard to believe, but we are remodeling 10% of our skeleton every year. And this is a constant process that's necessary to maintain blood calcium at a very specific level, because you need calcium in your blood at all times, and I'll come back to why that's important at the end of the talk uh, for skeletal reasons and muscle reasons. So there's a process. There's bone resorption occurs. First, you dig out the old skeleton, and then there's these resorption cavities, and then you have new osteoblasts come in, and they form new bone. So it's like remodeling in your house or an apartment. Uh, you know, you move furniture around, but you don't change the actual size of the uh, apartment itself. You're just frigging around a bit with the, the furniture and stuff. So you're remodeling. And this is exactly what happens in the skeleton. It's really important because old bones are more fragile. So you want remodeling to occur. You really want to be able to turn this bone over. Plus, bone is the richest source of calcium, so you really have to have a constant source of calcium. And you need more sometimes. So remember that one caveat. Sometimes you need more calcium from bone and I'll show you why that's important. Okay, so it's complex. There are multiple cellular players, um, and this includes the osteoblast, which is laying down bone, the osteoclast, but it's all very symphonic. Everything occurs in a rhythm, and it's very uh, proactive. It's always designed to maintain a certain amount of bone. So when you're young, you build your peak bone mass, and then during your life, you hold on to it as long as you can. With aging, it tends to go down a little bit, but it's that rapid decline that we worry about. Those are the people who generally get into trouble with osteoporosis. So these are the players, and we've been interested in the fat cell, which is also involved, and then there's macrophages that come in, and then there's this little canopy over the remodeling site. So each unit is called a bone remodeling unit. It's an osteoclast, an osteoblast, and a, a lining cell. But the big player in this is the osteocyte. And this is a newly discovered, really interesting, neural-looking cell that looks like this, with tremendous numbers of dendrites. 
that go out. Now, the, the osteocyte is embedded. So if you take a cross section of the bone, the osteocyte's sitting right in these little lacunae. And then around them is all the bone that's been woven. So it's a big circle, and these are called osteons. And it turns out that these osteocytes are really osteoblasts that have done their thing, and then they become entombed within the bone itself. So for many years, you know, there's a reason they call us researchers boneheads. And the reason is because we never really see the light of day. And the osteocyte we always thought of as just a dead osteoblast, not doing much. But the truth of the matter is they have lots of canaliculi, and these contain messages that are transmitted to the remodeling unit. So you have the vasculature, which is feeding the osteocyte, and then you have the osteocyte that's acting through these canaliculi to talk to osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So as it turns out, the cell that we thought did nothing is actually the command and control for bone remodeling. Now why, would I, why do we even care about that in this talk? Because it turns out that for many years we were looking for what was the cell that responds to gravitatory forces. And the answer is it's the osteocyte. So it's the flow of canalicular fluid that's transmitted during gravity that allows the osteocyte to sense and send signals back to the osteoblast and osteoclast. So in the absence of gravity, what you get is an osteocyte that's actually digesting bone. It has the capacity not only to signal, but the osteocyte can actually release enzymes that can break down bone. And so the thing we learned about the basic cellular target of gravity is the osteocyte. And with spaceflight or microgravity, these osteocytes digest the bone around them. And this is called osteocytic osteolysis. And again, these are concepts that only in the past five years have we been able to get our hands around. Because it turns out, when you remove estrogen with ovariectomy of mice and in humans, that the same process occurs. So the osteocyte is sort of a dual player. It's an old osteoblast, but it's got the capacity to resorb bone as well. And so this is the command and control. So if you can remember that, we'll come back to that at the end of this talk, because it's a very important observation. So let me summarize part one. Exercise has shown very minimal change in bone mass. Loading the skeleton enhances bone remodeling. Unloading is associated with bone loss. The osteocyte is the skeletal sensor for loading and is the determinant of unloading as well. And it secretes factors that increase osteoclasts, but also uh, release uh, enzymes that digest bone. So, so exercise does a lot of other things, including maintaining leanness. What mediates the non-skeletal muscle response to exercise? So it turns out that when we exercise, our muscles activate PGC1-alpha, which is a co-activator of a number of different factors. And you can see in this slide that PGC1-alpha, which is activated by AMP kinase and a number of other uh, stimulatory factors, work on a number of nuclear receptors to enhance fatty acid oxidation uh, uh, and uh, uh, assembly of cellular uh, material, as well as uh, the fission and fusion process in mitochondria. And it turns out, and angiogenesis through uh, ERRs, it turns out that PGC1-alpha in the muscle is activated during exercise. And with that exercise, there's also uh, a change in the fat cells uh, in the body in response to exercise. And we know from some eloquent work from Bruce Spiegelman and others that with uh, PGC1-alpha activation, that fat cells change their characteristics. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that is. So if you knock out PGC1-alpha uh, from muscle, you prevent any change in the adipocyte. So let me just talk briefly about the adipocyte because it's an important 
cell. I told you already that I'm prejudiced because I study it in the marrow. But the adipocyte is also a, uh, extremely important for whole body homeostasis. And there's really three types of adipocytes. The white adipocyte you're all familiar with. Nobody wants to have a lot of adipocytes uh, uh, because with obesity, you get an increase in the number, but you also get an increase, more importantly, in the size of the adipocyte. And as the adipocyte expands, it starts setting off some inflammatory markers, and this becomes an obesity becomes an inflammatory type of condition. So expansion, which is the major reason for obesity, rather than recruitment of new adipocytes, is really a pro-inflammatory process. It stores fat. Um, and it sits there. The other type of adipocyte, there are two other types. One is called the brown adipocyte. So we're all born with a little brown fat and we never thought much of it. Uh, but in the old days, before incubators, um, babies were born. How did they stay warm? Uh, one of the reasons they stayed warm is they had brown fat. And this is preformed brown adipose tissue, which is sitting in the, um, primarily in the mediastinum. And it's present for about two or three years of life. And it's a major adaptation to prevent shivering thermogenesis. So there's only two ways you can keep your body warm. One is to shiver, which is very inefficient. And the other is by uh, inducing brown fat, which is activated by sympathetic tone. So you go out in the cold, like that picture running, you're going to activate whatever brown fat you have left. Unfortunately, not all of us have much brown fat. Um, and we'd all like to be babies because there's tons of brown fat. Uh, so we know that brown fat induces a thermogenic program because of uncoupling protein 1 and that it's sympathetically mediated. And if you look at the adipocytes, just look at the difference. They don't even look like a fat cell. These are brown fat cells. Now there's a third type of adipocyte called the beige adipocyte, or the, yeah, uh, there's a number of different names, but in the subcutaneous fat of us, uh, compared to the visceral fat, there's this third type of adipocyte which looks a lot like brown fat. And in fact, it has a thermogenic program. So subcutaneous fat, which we know is somewhat protective for cardiovascular disease, one of the reasons is, is because it's not storing a lot of fat, it's, or fatty acids. It's really producing a thermogenic program. So we have white, beige, and brown. And in the mouse, beige adipocytes are found primarily in the inguinal depot. In us, it's present in most of our subcutaneous fat. Okay, so if we overexpress PGC1-alpha in mice, then what you see is this marked increase in the inguinal fat depot of these brown type fat cells, which we call beige if they're outside of the mediastinum. And these are thermogenically mediated. In mice, you can actually see the color difference between yellow which is the classic fat, and beige, which is the uh, brown fat. Um, so you increase that. And Bruce Spiegelman and his colleagues realized that this was a function of increasing um, exercise and the activation of PGC1. And they identified a membrane-bound protein called FNDC5. And FNDC5 is sitting on the muscle membrane. And when you go out and run, FNDC5 gets cleaved, and it releases a peptide fragment called irisin. And Bruce speculated that irisin actually was the uh, peptide that was stimulating beige fat to have a thermogenic program during exercise. So we all know if you run and you exercise and you do stuff, you don't get fat. And one of the reasons is, is because you're utilizing a lot of that fat for, uh, for uh, heat. And so in the obesity world, anything we can do to make more beige fat or brown fat, the better the drug's going to be. And there have been numbers of different uh, uh, exploratory studies looking at different compounds that do it. Most of these fat cells are innervated by a beta-3 adrenergic receptor. And so a lot of work is focused on beta-3 adrenergic stimulation. The other way to do it is to trick the pre-adipocyte into becoming a beige adipocyte 
rather than a white adipocyte. Now, you think I'm getting off target, but I'm not. We'll get to why this is important for exercise. So the hypothesis has been that PGC1-alpha releases FNDC5. It gets cleaved by an enzyme. We're not sure what it is. Irisin goes to the white adipocytes, increases UCP1. That becomes a beijing or browning phenotype. Bang, you get this uh, fat uh, uh, burning. Thermogenic capacity increases. They become more insulin sensitive. Um, uh, and um, this has been a, uh, a really exciting part of the new area of obesity. And we can measure using mass, quantitative mass spec that with moderate exercise, there's an increase in irisin. And with intensive exercise, there's a marked increase in irisin. So, so now the trick in the obesity world is not only to treat adiposity, but also insulin resistance by enhancing the ability to make more of these beige cells in the subcutaneous fat. So we've known for a long time apples versus pears. You probably learned about this, that the uh, apple phenotype is more cardiovascular risk. It's also more insulin uh, uh, resistant. And the pear shape is more uh, subcutaneous fat and is more insulin sensi sensitive. So uh, Bruce started a company called Embers for a good reason, to look at Iris. And I was on the, worked with him on this. Uh, it fizzled like uh, the fire, but, uh, but we didn't give up. Um, uh, it was hard to get an a iris and peptide that really uh, would able to be stable in, uh, in the environment. So um, great story. Fat cells, we understand. The question was, was iris affecting the skeleton? So remember where iris comes from. It comes from the muscle. So one of the things, the caveats that we've known for a while is that myokines, muscle secreted factors, can have an impact on bone. So remember, let's go to gross anatomy, muscles insert on bones uh, through tendons. And, and so the more exertion the muscle puts on the bone, the better this, the skeleton is. Now, does it increase bone mass? No, but the possibility that you need some degree of uh, force on that bone is really important. So the question is, do, do muscles secrete factors that might impact the skeleton? And the answer is, well, I've already shown you irisin. There are probably some other factors that do it. So our question was, is does the circulating irisin act as an endocrine hormone uh, or a paracrine hormone and affect the skeleton? So. This was, uh, we've been working on this for three and a half years. Uh, I knew Bruce from the company, so we were very fascinated by it. And we got scooped immediately. Uh, so PNAS, about two years ago, Maria Grano and my colleague and collaborator, Moni Zaidi. Moni called me up and said, Cliff, do you want to collaborate with us? We think we have some good data that irisin stimulates new bone formation. And I said, you know, we've been working with Bruce for a while. And, will pass. So they got their paper in PNAS, and it showed that there was an increase in bending strength and some increase in cortical bone, this thick white area, but no increase in trabecular bone. They gave very little irisin, which was really surprising to us. So we weren't really sure. We put it in the back of our mind and said, let's just keep doing what we're doing, and I'll show you what we're doing. Well. Then, a few months later, they came out with a second paper. Didn't quite make PNAS, but made scientific reports that said, look, if you unload the skeleton, you get this huge reduction in bone mass. But if you give irisin again in this once a week, low dose, it's restored. So this was the Bible. This was at two papers, irisin improves bone mass, and we're scooped. So we're sitting in the lab at Dana-Farber and say, you know, what are we going to do? So we decided to turn to our old friend, the mouse, and do genetic models. So I spent 15 years at Jackson Lab and learned all about mouse physiology. I talked to the students about it. You know, it was a fun time. I didn't realize how valuable these guys are. But we decided to look at genetic models and see if we could help understand in our own mind what Irison was doing. So the first thing we did, so we hypothesized 
that irisin would be a bone forming agent and that it would act on the skeleton when it's released from muscle. Very simple hypothesis. Absolutely had to be true because exercise is good for you because two papers came out showed it's true. So the first thing we did is we, um, we got a transgenic overexpressing mouse. So the FNDC, this was a muscle specific, so it was overexpressing FNDC5, the parent peptide, in muscle only, although it's a leaky promoter and it's expressed elsewhere. And we thought for sure we would find increased bone density. So let me just show you the difference. And I think anybody can see it. So here's the normal bone and here's the transgenic. And the bone is gone. I mean, if you look closely, look at all these trabeculi. These are these little white spots, you know. They're not there. So we said, we don't believe it. Something's wrong with the mouse. This was a three-month mouse. So we sacked a few more mice at five months of age. Even worse. Transgenic overexpression. Even worse. So then we waited to 13 months. We're going to find this. No effect. In fact, the bone density is markedly lower. So that made us think, so what's going on? Our hypothesis, irisin's got to have a positive effect on bone, right? It's just got to. There's no reason why it wouldn't have a positive effect on bone. Okay. So um, um, the next thing we did is we, um, let me see if I can, oh yeah, so uh, this is, this is, uh, we also, we decided that throw out the femur, this is the bones we did. Let's look at the vertebrae and see if we can see it in the vertebrae, because that's another skeletal site, and the same thing showed up. So that was wrong. So we're on the wrong track. It's doing the opposite. Then we took the bone cells out, cultured them, thought, oh, they must show higher ability to form colony forming units and to form mineral. Nothing. But the one thing we did, which was, I remember talking to Bruce at Saturday afternoon, and I said, I can't believe this. We took out some of their bone cells from the overexpressing mice, and we cultured them in uh, MCSF and Rankle to see what their osteoclasts were like. And all of a sudden, in one plate, we saw these huge osteoclasts. And I called Bruce, I said, this doesn't make any sense. They're making these big osteoclasts. So we did it three times, and each time we found both the number and size. Look at how small these uh, osteoclasts are at day five, and look at these are really big. So Bruce says to me, Cliff, I don't like that transgenic mouse model. Let's just put that aside. We'll do something else. So <laughs> the next thing we did, um, oh, and we looked at gene expression, and one of the interesting things was when we looked at the marrow gene expression, all the markers of beijing were present in the marrow. So it was suggesting that the, that the fat cells in the marrow were actually being targeted by irisin. So we knew that the gene expression over, the forced expression was working. They were making sort of beijing type fat cells. And when we looked at the number of those fat cells, they were smaller and uh, there were less of them, suggesting like Remember the running exercise, Linda Bonewald experiment, where she put the mice in for a year and showed no marrow fat cells? Very similar thing with the transgenic. So maybe long-term expression was working, but why was the bones different? So we switched models, and we performed a knockout. We deleted FMDC5 from mouse. And what did we see? Look at the difference, huge increase in bone mass, huge increase in bone mass. Well, we were really freaked out about this. How is this possible that if you take irisin out, you actually remove uh, the molecule, you shouldn't be getting higher bone mass. So we didn't believe it. So what we did is we did an experiment which we took out the ovaries from those mice and said, what would happen? They should lose a lot of bone if, in fact, they're estrogen deficient. And what we found, in fact, was that they were totally protected against ovariectomy-induced bone loss. So this is highly unusual. When you take away estrogen, you lose bone. To protect it like that made us really 
wake up and say, wait a minute, I, our hypothesis can't be right. It just can't be right. We have to think about what the science is telling us. Something about irisin is important for osteoclasts. Remember those giant osteoclasts? They're resorbing bone. So then we looked by scanning electron microscopy at the bone, the cortical bones. Remember the osteocyte, the command and control cell. So this is the FNDC5 wild type mouse, and this is the uh, FNDC5 sham operated, and they're very similar. Look at what happens with, when you take the ovaries out. The lacunae just expand dramatically. It looks like space flight, and their bone density is it, it really lost in the wild type. But look at the FNDC5 knockouts. No osteocytic osteolysis. So that made us think, aha, irisin is acting on the osteocyte. So here's the lacunar area. And in fact, that led us to test irisin in an osteocyte cell system. And here, we showed a dose-dependent impact on sclerostin, one of the major osteocyte uh, products, uh, both in, uh, by protein and RNA. And we showed that when you give irisin, you actually prevent those osteocytes from dying out. So there's something about irisin that works on these osteocytes. Now, it's inducing osteocytic osteolysis, but it may also be doing something else. And what else it's doing, and I, I didn't put it in there, but it's, we've got very strong evidence now that it actually directly works on those osteoclasts. So it's making those osteoclasts bigger. Now, why is this important, and what would this mean? Oh, and, and in the cell paper, we identified at least one receptor for irisin, integrin alpha V beta 5. And we purified that and, and did some conditional studies. And we now know that this is one of the receptors for, for irisin. So we now know the receptor, we now know the ligand, but we're still a bit puzzled by what irisin is doing. So irisin increases following exercise, it induces Beijing away to adipose tissue, and increases the thermogenic program. It binds to the integrin receptor family and increases bone resorption both through osteocytic osteolysis and by directly stimulating the osteoclast. So we've had long talks about this. Why would a protein that's released by exercise have this impact? And Bruce Spiegelman is an adipocyte guy. He's not a bone guy, but he's, he's a very original thinker. And he said, you know, Cliff, this reminds me of parathyroid hormone. So as you may or may not know, parathyroid hormone induces bone remodeling. And Forteo is the drug that is used to treat osteoporosis because when you give it intermittently, it stimulates new bone formation. If you do it on a constant basis and infuse them over time, it actually causes bone resorption. And so the paradigm in clinical medicine, if you had somebody come in with severe osteoporosis, you treat them with Forteo, a daily injection of, uh, of uh, Forteo um, for uh, a period of two years. And you can build bone. It's an anabolic factor, but it's only anabolic because you give it intermittently. So remember the Grano paper. They showed that if you gave low dose, very low dose, you could possibly get an effect on the skeleton. So here we have two very inconsistent results. But what's the difference? The irisin story for us was a chronic sustained level of irisin. If you chronically sustain PTH, and we know this from mouse models, you actually get low bone mass. So irisin could be an anabolic factor. Why? Because it stimulates the osteoclast and the osteocyte, and then that turns on the osteoblast, much like parathyroid hormone. So that, that's all hypothetical. We haven't proven it yet because we still need to do the intermittent studies. But it was a reasonable hypothesis. But there was another aspect that really bothered us. Why would irisin cause bone resorption? It doesn't make physiologic sense. What's the reason? that you release a peptide when you're exercising, your muscles are exercising, and you're doing it. So why would this happen? So this is really uh, an interesting story, and it's a great 
example of clinical research and how clinical research can illustrate some of the things you see at the basic level and come back to it. So I have a good friend, Wendy Court, who was at University of Colorado in Denver. And uh, when I stop out to see her, my sister-in-law lives in Fort Collins, so I always go to UC Denver and see what they're doing. They've tried to recruit me a couple times. I called Wendy up uh, because the last time I went to visit, about a year and a half ago, she said, she pulled me into her lab. She's a great exercise physiologist and is one of the leading investigators in Motopac, which is this new, huge uh, NIH-wide initiative to study the effects of exercise on different tissues. She pulled me aside, I'll never forget, I sat down, and she says, Cliff, you know, the funny thing is, I've been exercising people for a long time, and I see this drop in blood calcium that occurs within 15 to 20 minutes of exercise. And I said, really? And I said, oh, it must be the sweat or something. She said, no, 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 it's not sweat. They're not losing it from sweat. And I said, you sure? And she said, oh, we've measured sweat. It's not, the calcium's not being leached on. Uh, I said, well, you know, it, it's probably nothing, you know. And she said, I don't think it's nothing. So anyways, after we got the iris and thing, I called Wendy up. I said, Wendy, are you still doing that calcium stuff, that nonsense that you talked to me about before? And she said, you know, by the way, I have. This paper's coming out soon. And I said, really? And she said, do you know, Cliff, that PTH goes up after exercise? And I said, no, I didn't know that, but that's really interesting because we know that if, you, if I put you in a room and give you no calcium for a week, your blood calcium will remain normal. Why? Beca not because you're recruiting osteoclasts, because that takes time because you have osteocytic osteolysis. If you want calcium in a hurry, you can get it out of the skeleton in minutes by stimulating PTH. So calcium goes down, this is physiology 101. In our bodies, calcium goes down, PTH goes up. That's the evolution of how we came from water-based to land-based. We needed a system to control calcium, and water-based animals, all the calcium in the world is free in the salt water. You go up on land, you needed a system to maintain calcium, PTH. So she said, do you know that? And I said, I, I didn't know that, but that's interesting because why and how do you get calcium mobilized that quickly? So she said, oh, Cliff, come on. I, this paper's coming out next week. Just go look at the paper. So here's the paper. It's a beautiful paper. So she designed this study. So only in Colorado with huge exercisers, right? So she puts these men on this intense 30-minute, fast-as-you-can-go bicycle program. You know, they're just going to town. And, and they've got catheters in everywhere. And, uh, and they're measuring um, PTH. CTX is a measure of bone resorption, ionized calcium, and urine calcium, and sweat calcium. So this is the uh, thing. And what she did is... In one group, she gave them calcium infusion through catheter. In another group, she just let them um, go without giving them any calcium. So that's the protocol. Beautiful study. Okay, so the average age of these volunteers, they got paid a lot, is 34.4 years. They're thin people. These are not obese individuals. Uh, and they have pretty good v VO2, uh, peak VO2. Serum vitamin D level's normal. They don't have bone density. Okay, so here's the data. And this is really cool, at least for us boneheads. But, um, so here's the ionized calcium. So this is the calcium infusion group. And this is the individuals who did not get treated with calcium intravenously. And you can see ionized calcium goes down. And look at it uh, even more dramatic in this uh, picture with exercise, with intense exercise. And then... Um, you can see also total calcium goes down as well. So she's right. This is what happens. Now look at PTH. In 60 minutes, cal uh, parathyroid hormone rises, and by two hours, it's, it's three times or twice as high as what it was at baseline. And with that, you get this correction in calcium. So your calcium comes back to normal in the calcium infusion studies even without intravenous calcium. Why? 
because PTH goes up so high, it's driving calcium out of the skeleton. And the only way to do it that quickly is with osteocytic osteolysis. And to prove that, CTX, which is a measure of the resorption of the matrix, goes way up, and it fits perfectly. So it's a beautiful study, absolutely beautiful study. So what does that mean? So what I think it means to, uh, to me, and we can interpret it many different ways, is that calcium is probably going back into muscle. And the loss of blood calcium during exercise is probably a function of all the exercise the muscles are doing. PTH is your counter-regulatory hormone that's preventing it. Remember, what else is produced during muscle exercise? Irisin. And what does irisin do? It drives osteocytic osteolysis. So I think physiologically, irisin is there, just like PTH, to modulate that calcium during exercise. So it's a physiologic hormone that goes up during exercise. So what's really cool about that is if you can design intermittent PTH to be anabolic to bone, why not do the same thing for irisin? And that's what we're currently working on now. So let me summarize. Irisin stimulates bone resorption. This leads to bone loss. Although the osteoclast, remember, it's tightly coupled to the osteoblast. And I know you don't remember the image of the osteoclast and the osteoblast, but the osteoclast is the first thing to digest bone. It's releasing factors that tell the osteoblast to come in and lay down new bone. You need that intracellular signaling. So if you activate the osteoclast, you can get bone remodeling and you can get osteoblast uh, to come in and make new bone. So the trick is to do it in such a way, maybe the way that paper did it, which we didn't believe, and that is very intermittently. It works on the receptor. The acute release of irisin may be a compensatory action, and um, that release of calcium is osteocytic osteolysis. So what are the challenges? Is intermittent irisin similar to PTH and can it induce bone formation indirectly as the Grano paper showed? What other receptors do irisin bind to? Um, you know, the uh, integrins are asleep with everybody, so you're going to have lots of different uh, ligands and other proteins that bind, so we really need to figure out what else is binding. And if irisin concentrations rise in human following acute exercise, how does that lead into uh, our full understanding of exercise physiology? So I want to finish with three sort of caveats that, um, that I think are useful, at least in my career. The first is follow the science. Science is certainly the underpinning of medicine. But hypotheses are for testing, not for proving them at all costs. And I think sometimes uh, we get so invested, both from a funding point of view and from a paper point of view, that we're dying to prove our hypothesis correct. And it's very hard to say it isn't right because you thought of it. And that part of science is where conflicts come in. And also, science tells you something. So every time you do an experiment, make sure to think about it in a global way, not just uh, I've shown this because I thought that this is what it did. Because it's always going to point you. I had an old mentor, Steve Teitelbaum at WashU, who always said, Cliff, just follow the science. It's going to take you to where you want to be. Um, <clears throat> and if you understand, as docs in training, if you understand the physiology behind the science, it's even more exciting. Because then you can go back and ask the kind of questions we ask. Second, always doubt your diagnosis. I was chief resident, and I'd have all my hotshot residents come to me, and, and they said, well, we know this is the diagnosis. And I said, look, one of Rosen's rules is, there are two rules in, on the bed, in the bedside that I always used to say. The first is, uh, is uh, that uh, always doubt your diagnosis. And the second is stupid, but it says, that if you don't know what's going on, bad things will happen. <laughs> <laughs> and you can be surprised how often that comes up in clinical medicine. When you're really underwater, bad things can happen. Uh, but always doubt your diagnosis. Healthy skepticism is essential at the bedside and at the bench. And finally, in this we lose sight of a lot of, although the students told me that all the time today, that this was about helping people. That science and medicine 
are for helping people. And I would add a fourth thing, and, and that is from this slide, from the next slide, which is that collaborations are really essential. That in your life, whether you're a physician or a scientist, these are all the people that have worked with me uh, and all the grants that we've got that have brought us to the point we're at. So don't ever be afraid to collaborate because that is clearly one of the most essential elements of science. And just to show you our lab and my lab, uh, <laughs> Bella, who is a constant source every day at 4.30 on my trail walks that tells me what I'm doing right or wrong. So thank you very much and I'm happy to answer questions. Yes, yep, that's part of a KL1 that's going in next week. And uh, I just wrote the letter of collaboration. So yes, we have a very talented postdoc in Bruce's lab who uh, came from the Brown and Goldstein lab, who's super aggressive and ambitious. And so yes, we are clearly looking at that. You know, there are obviously other integrants. So in the osteoclast story, we've been doing that in our lab. The osteoclasts really blow up in response to, uh, to uh, uh, Irisin, and um, I just got an email this morning looking at the resorption. We can actually put the osteoclast on matrix and watch them resorb bone in vitro. And uh, so Irisin makes them resorb bone, which is really important. They not only need to be big, but they need to resorb bone. But there, alpha V beta 3 appears to be a, a more important receptor. So there's lots of integrin receptors. We're still trying to understand it. But the biggest challenge in the lab is the partner with, we think there's a partner with, uh, uh, with uh, Irisin. And that we have to find out what it is. Mike, yes. So uh, I, I think it's fascinating. I'm, I'm just going to make a quick little parallel to my role in neuroscience. Yeah. So we talk often in neuroscience about uh, what's called the research consumption hypothesis. That is, within very small volumes in the brain, if you deplete a resource like calcium from the extracellular space due to activity yep. of neurons, you can have very dramatic effects locally on things like synaptic transmission by changing calcium. Right. So I, I can't help but think here, based on what you said, both in, in cardiac tissue, skeletal muscle, the, this resource consumption, the letting it loose, et cetera, what are the dynamic effects locally on the physiology of the muscle, whether it be cardiac or skeletal? Right. Well, I think it raises a really important question about the local effects on the osteocyte in response to the lack of calcium, which is one thing that's actually really important, and certainly on muscle as well. You know, I'm not a muscle person, so I don't really understand some of the local mechanisms that are going on. And uh, the idea that calcium is flooding back into muscle is purely an idea. I mean, I don't think the flux... We don't have any data that there's this massive flux of calcium in there, and we don't understand it. It's not well described in the literature, and I, I'm not sure why, but um, it's really um, not well understood. Um, but calcium is essential for both osteoclast-mediated bone resorption and the osteocyte, and we're trying to understand when a local, what you were talking about, local effect occurs like that, how does the osteocyte respond to something like that? Because it's a very acutely responsive system. So there must be some local, because remember the muscles attached to the bone, the, the osteocytes are right there next to the muscle. But I don't think we know the answer to that yet. But isn't it funny how the osteocyte looks so much like the neuron? So, so we have, uh, Mike, it's interesting, I just want to, sorry students, but uh, <laughs> I don't get to see Mike very often. But So we, ha we found a uh, protein, so um, uh, just a quick anecdote. Um, the misty mouse was uh, a, a cute little mouse. We were talking about mice and what color they were as they age and they become alopecia. Well, the misty mouse was initially mapped. It, had, it has a white spot on its belly. It's a very cute little black six mouse. It's been known for about 40 years in Jackson lab. So the misty mouse um, has a white patch and it was used to map in the old days before we had the whole genome mapped to map the leptin receptor, which was important for obesity. Turns out the misty mouse has a mutation in a gene called DOC7, which is important in axon tracking. 
And what's really cool is DOC7 is highly expressed in the osteocyte during differentiation. And whether that's also allowing this tracking of canaliculi. So we got the conditional, we made it ourselves, and sure enough, they have very low bone mass. So we're now trying to understand exactly what DOC7's role is. But the resemblance is so, you know, it's incredible. Other questions? questions? Yes. Is there a constitutive knockout of irisin? Yeah, so <laughs> that's the other part of the grant. Great question. Is there a knockout of irisin? So we're currently making a CRISPR-Cas9 FNDC5 um, uh, uh, flox allele to knock it out in uh, muscle first and then in bone. Um, the global knockout is available. But uh, conditional is not, and that's what we're doing in our lab right now, is making flox alleles for the FNDC5 gene, and then we can knock it out in, in bone. One of the things that we're troubled by a bit is that FNDC5 is expressed in a lot of different tissues. And so um, when we did ovariectomy, we were shocked to see the blood irisin rise. And, we don't, uh, and that was associated with the ovariectomy bone loss but we don't understand where that's coming from. So in order to make the story much more complete, we've got to get a conditional that allows us to, to actually be able to see what source. Is it coming from muscle alone, or are there other sources? So that's a big challenge for us. Yes? I have a question more like on the clinical side. Yes, good. Like where ultimately it might yeah. end up in terms of irisin, you talked about it might have like a similar effect as PTA. Yes, yes. So I'm wondering, Yes. It as a drug target. yes. Yes. Do we think it might work more effectively or in Yes. With yeah. PTA? Yeah. So we don't know the answer to that. The genetic models are a little misleading because it's constant increases in the blood level of irisin. So we, you know, and that causes bone loss. So we don't know. It's still a hypothesis that needs to be tested. We do have some evidence from our competitors that gave very little irisin that it had an anabolic effect on bone. So, we, so there are two strategies that we're trying to approach. One is, um, uh, is to go to Google and, uh, and talk to them about funding antibody studies in which we raise antibodies to irisin and see if we block irisin, does that improve bone mass or does it make it worse? And the other is to use different uh, doses of irisin intermittently. And then the third thing we've done is we got an AAV virus and we've put irisin in there and, um, and we're looking at how that works short term over six to eight weeks. So I think the, it's a great question. I, we don't know the answer yet. Yes? So irisin is a cleaved product, right? So presumably the whole protein might also have a function. Yes. In your genetically modified mouse, aren't you afraid that you might actually mess up with those functions? Oh, for sure. Yes, yes. I mean, I think, you know, our mouse models are very limited. Uh, I think they provide us with some insight, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the parent compound probably is doing other things as well. So, yes, absolutely right. It could be an issue. Yes? Two questions. One is, have you considered whether the number of PTH receptors on the osteocytes is changing? And the second question is, in your giant osteoclasts, yes. are there more nuclei? Have yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that I can answer. So yes, there, it, it, there definitely is more fusion, and there are definitely more nuclei. Um, so they're very classically bigger osteoclasts, and they resorb more bone. So, and so we know that much. Um, in, in response to your first question about the PTH receptor, it's a very interesting story. So we published in Cell Metabolism last year that um, when we conditionally delete the PTH receptor using a bone-specific deletion, we get this mouse that has tons of marrow fat and very, very bad bone. So we started wondering what was going on in this mouse model. And what we realized is, is that, the, um, that the number of PTH receptors is really important. And in the peripheral fat, Bruce Spiegelman had reported a few years ago that cardiac, I mean not cardiac, cancer cachexia was associated with an increase in PTH-related peptide, which works on the PTH receptor. 
And he hypothesized that the cachexia was due to the high PTHRP acting to actually drive thermogenic program uh, in peripheral fat cells. Well, we got interested because we thought, gee, you know, the PTH receptor, you knock it out and you get all these fat cells. So what we did is we did an experiment just published in FASA where we took, old, we took mice and we made them calorie deficient. So we, yesterday you had this great talk from the Pennington guy. And uh, so when you make uh, mice calorie uh, insufficient, 30% calorie restriction, they expand their marrow fat. And in anorexia, it's really dramatic in humans. So marrow fat goes way up with calorie restriction. So we asked the question, if you treat with PTH, what happens to these individuals? And in humans, our collaborators had shown that anorexics respond beautifully to PTH. So when we did that in the mouse, we found that the number of fat cells was decreased and the bone response was even greater than what we expected. So we think PTH in the marrow fat cell, unique fat cell, unique home base, the marrow, actually expresses a lot of PTH receptors. And so it's active in the skeleton with PTH. It's actually helping to transfer fatty acids from the adipocyte to the skeleton and fueling an increase in bone formation. So it's really sort of a nifty story. And we have some in vivo evidence of that transfer of fatty acids. So the fat cell is unique in that it's not the same in every site. The fat in the visceral fat is inflammatory. Fat in the inguinal fat is very, very much, uh, or subcutaneous fat is very much insulin sensitive. And now we know the marrow fat is very different because it originates from these progenitors. So, so it's really kind of a nifty secondary story about how we can make new bone by f not just stimulating the osteoblast, but stimulating fuel for the osteoblast. Yes? Yes, yes. Because I feel like the textbook paradigm is like osteoblast build bone, osteoblast. Yes, right, bone. right, right. And where osteocytic osteolysis fits into that, yes. it's kind of changing the paradigm. So it, it, it is. It's a great question. And it's only been the first paper uh, was in Nature Medicine about five, five years ago where they looked at lactation. So we looked at lactation and missed the whole boat on, uh, on uh, osteocytic osteolysis. So we uh, followed lactating mice for uh, it's 21 days and then they are weaned off. And during lactation, you lose a tremendous amount of bone. Mothers and mice lose bone. Uh, and um, it's all bone resorption, or at least we thought it was osteoclast activation because you need calcium for the mom, for the milk, et cetera. So that was sort of a slam dunk. Interesting, in mothers that lactate, their bone density comes back and comes back better than what it was when they started. And in fact, lactation probably protects against osteoporosis. So repetitive lactation, actually, those mothers are actually have better bone density. Anyways, so we were looking at it, trying to understand what happened to marrow fat. And marrow fat goes away. Mice with five babies, feeding five babies for three weeks is a big deal uh, for the mouse. And so they lose all their fat mass and then they ultimately get it better. But what we missed, and what this group at Yale and another group at Arkansas showed was most of the calcium is not from the osteoclast coming from osteocytic osteolysis. So then everybody said, oh, okay, so what happens with ovariectomy? Same thing, driving calcium out of bone. So the paradigm is changing. These osteocytes are active, they're metabolically active, they're causing bone resorption, and um, they are digesting around their lacunae. So it is changing. Uh, and, and the other paradigm that's changing, I used to have this cartoon, and the osteoblast is the quarterback, and the osteoclast is the receiver, and the osteoblast tells everybody what to do. Not true anymore. In fact, osteoclasts tell osteoblasts what to do. So it's an evolving paradigm. Yes? Right, romososumab, yes. Yes, yes clorostin so, antibody. I'm just curious, um, we know that it only slows bone degeneration, and I'm curious right. if you think that osteocytic osteolysis is the um, kind of takes over that bone resorptive. Yeah, 
So that's a great question, and it, it certainly is one element of it. So that uh, sclerostin antibody, I was at the FDA, I was a part of the FDA hearing on it, and it's going to get approved eventually. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I think that that's the osteocytic osteolysis is, is part of that. And remember that sclerostin um, that it's targeting stops bone formation and also increases bone resorption. And remember, that's coming from the osteocyte. So the treatment is really targeting the osteocyte. Sclerostin really only comes, I shouldn't say only, but almost exclusively comes from the osteocyte. However, there was this off-target cardiovascular effect from romososumab. So two of the three randomized trials showed a 30% increase in cardiovascular risk associated with one year of treatment with romososumab. And that was the hang-up for the FDA. And the question is, why? Off-target effects, unbelievable. But sclerostin is actually made in the vasculature. And it may be a good thing in the vasculature. And this comes back to the PTH story, where PTH is exactly the opposite in the vasculature as it is in bone. So anyways, so uh, yeah, so it, it is a component of it. All right. Well set. Oh, one more, yes. Yes, um, yes. Do you have any insight as to why the anti-sclerostin and some of the others yes. are restricted for people who have radiation? There's some really, yeah, no. Answer, and I don't know well, I think the PTH, yes, the thing about PTH, no, yeah, and, and the new one, yeah. yeah. So the anabolics, both. So, so I think that relates to one is that... Um, Remember what sclerostin does. Sclerostin <laughs> binds to the Wnt signaling pathway and blocks Wnt activation. So the concern in the bone world is when you activate Wnt signaling exclusively, you're stimulating new bone formation, the risk of osteosarcoma increases. And with parathyroid hormone, there have been a few cases reported of osteosarcoma. So both Forteo has a black box warning, and sclerostin, they're worried about it. They haven't seen this, but any cancer, people get nervous that there'd be a second osteosarcoma arise. So it's, it's, it's the constant stimulation of the osteoblast that they're most worried about. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Mike. It was great to see you. Thank you for staying and listening. Yeah. <laughs>